So is this sloppy science or is this real? Until people can reproducibly do this, it's going to be skepticism is, is the order of the day. This is a big thing. But it's worth continuing to plug away at this because there could be new science here, things that we don't understand, a new power source. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Produced by Soapbox Media. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I'm going to wrap up my fusion arc with a little summary. I've done a a few podcasts on uh, nuclear fusion, and I'd like to just summarize what I've learned and then introduce what I'd like to talk about in my upcoming topics. I've had several good interviews on hot and cold fusion. I've interviewed doctors Omar Hurricane and Alex Zilstra from the National Ignition Facility in the U.S., Dr. Fulvio Militello of the MassU Experiment in the U.K., Dr. Edmund Storms of Los Alamos National Labs, and Lutz Jaintner on cold fusion and low-energy nuclear reactions. Interestingly, science popularizer and German physicist Sabine Hossenfelder, very popular on YouTube, has followed up by producing her own review of cold fusion. You should go take a look at that. It's pretty good. Uh, But sadly, I have not got any uh, responses to my interview requests from any of the major commercial ventures promising a quick path to fusion energy. So I'm going to follow up with those over coming months and see if I can get some more out of them. Uh, So stay tuned. If you do enjoy what you're hearing, please mash like on your podcast app uh, and share it with your friends. Uh, Come join me at The Rational View on Facebook. Uh, I'd love to chat with you and hear your uh, reactions to my work. So what have we learned in this series of podcasts? And I've been learning with you as I I interview people and uh, discuss uh, with the experts what's going on in fusion. So cold fusion, this is, you know, a blast from the past, uh, a dangerous episode for professional scientists. Luckily, I'm in industry, so I can talk about this without worrying about my tenure becoming uh, in question. Cold fusion has not yet been reliably harnessed, despite decades of study from the original uh, Pons and Fleischmann announcement in 1989. But I don't think we should shame them for this. And I don't think we should shut them out of scientific journals. I think there's a lot that we can learn. Something odd is happening. There are uh, odd results that need to be explored. And the reaction that they got, uh, although due to their perhaps um, news uh, release type of announcement, rather than going through the public, the peer review publication, um, I think exacerbated the situation a bit. But I don't think we should shame them for not for not becoming public or for not generating enough energy or commercial energy at this point. That doesn't mean that cold fusion doesn't exist as a thing. Hot fusion has been working for much longer uh, with much more funding uh, from governments and, and they haven't commercialized yet either. Fusion is not easy. Fusion is not coming to our rescue in the next decade. It's not going to have a significant impact on the environmental crisis pointed out to us by the International Panel on Climate Change. And it's maybe not going to be here the decade after that either. The largest government fusion programs in the world are the U.S. uh, National Ignition Facility based on over 100 high-power, extremely high-power lasers uh, blowing up a a tiny little... uh, pellet uh, called a whole rum with some hydrogen in it and deuterium and the planned international thermonuclear experimental reactor or ITER uh, is a huge physics experiment uh, based on confining ionized plasma in a toroidal tokamak which is a big vacuum chamber surrounded by huge electromagnets with uh, superconducting coils, hundreds of thousands of kilometers long, uh, huge amounts of energy going in uh, to produce hopefully huge amounts of energy out. 
huger, in fact, is the goal. But this isn't the whole story, because there are, there's also billions of dollars being invested right now in commercial fusion ventures, surprisingly. And this is something, you know, that I didn't have a lot of awareness, and I I'm unfortunately haven't shared with you very much either, although I've read about it online, and I urge you to as well. If you're interested and you want to look into these fusion companies, some of the largest are called Helion, General Fusion, and TAE Technologies. And each of the, the fusion companies out there, and there are several, has a unique idea that they believe gives them a commercial edge. And they're all out there looking for angel investors to, to give them billions of dollars to build out the uh, expansion. Because uh, as we've heard, uh, some, of, some of the leading scientists think it's just an engineering problem now. They're, the physics is mostly settled. And to get to commercial fusion power is basically an engineering challenge. Can you make it cheaply enough? The coolest thing uh, about these companies that I've read about, however, is it, the Helion technology are actually uh, planning to harness the back reaction of the high pressure fusing plasma on the magnetic fields. And this creates a back reaction in the coils, which creates a current which is what they use to drive electricity. So they're not actually harnessing heat. So you don't have the inefficiency of a heat engine, which is a problem in the simplest forms of energy generation, the burning wood to boil water, or burning oil to boil water, or burning gas to boil water, or burning coal to boil water, or burning spicy rocks to boil water, and make steam, which is the thing that powers the turbines that creates electricity. This is a a very inefficient process. If you make, you know, a certain amount of energy, the efficiency of, of these thermal engines is about 33%. Depend, you know, it can be higher at higher temperatures, but effectively most of these thermal processes only, gener only takes about 33% of the available energy and turns it into electricity. So ideas where uh, they aren't using the neutrons, high energy neutrons from the fusion to heat water, uh, and they're actually using these neutrons to create electricity or using the, you know, with photovoltaics, for example, uh, can be efficient, although photovoltaics themselves are very inefficient. But this idea by helium to use the back pressure of the plasma, fusing plasma, pushing back on the, on the confinement fields to create current is really cool in my, in my mind. So, Wow. I'd love to explore more about that. Hopefully we can get an interview with someone from Helium. I've interviewed experts in the field of laser fusion. This is inertial confinement fusion. Uh, Omar Hurricane and Alex Zilstra. By the way, Omar Hurricane, what a great name. Uh, and Alex Zilstra told me about how ignition has been achieved at the aptly named National Ignition Facility, or NIF, for a tiny fraction of a second on the order of a few picoseconds uh nowhere near sustainable yet in terms of commercial power but technically it succeeded to produce more energy than was pumped into the reaction chamber and uh, in our case uh you know we've been working at this for years we finally got to a state where the heating inside that that plasma that we can hold on to momentarily uh far exceeds all of the losses uh that uh tend to take the heat away and that 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 particular state is is called ignition and uh and, and so that's what we've done recently that's that's the paper that you you recently published and it's got a lot of immediate attention uh the first attainment of ignition in uh nuclear fusion effectively is this in any nuclear fusion process on earth the first attainment of of what you call ignition or is that even a thing that happens it's the first attainment in the laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's okay. the first uh, attainment, a, contr a controlled way in a laboratory, yes. So Now, to get to commercial, you have to get over the inefficiency of the lasers. And you have, you know, hundreds of 124 lasers or something like that, high-power lasers. And each of these lasers is you know, less than 10% efficient in terms of wall plug to photons efficiency. So it takes 10 times the energy that the lasers put in to make that light. So they're very in a very inefficient step in the process. So although they're producing more energy than they put into the plasma, they're not producing more energy than they took out of the grid. 
And, and that's, that's an important step. step. And that's an order of magnitude more energy is needed to get to that step uh, before your your break even with your grid anyway. And then you have to look at all the infrastructure costs and the power used to build up your infrastructure. And then you can get into your energy return on investment, which is another interesting thing that I love to look at in various power sources. So what I'm saying is this is way, way off yet. It's not there. And it's not going to be there this decade. Uh, and likely not next decade either. I also interviewed uh, MAST U experiment lead, Dr. Fulvio Militello. And, and Fulvio discussed some of the technical advances at the Mega Ampere Spherical Tokamak in the UK. Uh, this experiment will enable future experiments to stabilize their extremely hot plasma for longer periods. Uh, Fulvio suggests himself that fusion power probably won't be a significant player in the energy market until the latter half of this century. But he's quite excited about a number of fusion commercialization prospects, and he wouldn't tell me uh, which ones he's got his money on, but he's got some that he, he does like. And there's a lot of good ideas out there, as he says. Typically, in order to, to keep the plasma hot and generate the fusion reactions, we have to heat the plasma up. So if we let, let it cool, it cool down without any external uh, source of heating, uh, it will take a certain amount of time for it to cool down. Uh, and that is the confinement time. It's called confinement time. Uh, the longer this confinement time, uh, the more efficient uh, uh, and the closer we will be to uh, a, a working uh, fusion power plant. And he also plays Dungeons and Dragons, which is really cool. I also discussed the sordid details of the cold fusion fiasco. So if you were around Hans and Fleischmann back in 1989, uh, two uh, electrochemists announced uh, that they had created a revolutionary clean energy that would revolutionize the world uh, using just water and electricity to create fusion at low temperatures, low being you know a little bit above room temperature, a few hundred degrees, not millions of degrees that we see in these tokamaks. And their announcement led to uh, a sustained effort across uh, across academia to reproduce their experiment and a failure uh, of most labs to reproduce it. Not everybody. Some labs showed some interesting uh, and unexplainable results, but the failure to reproduce it along with the fact that their explanation of what was going on didn't make sense with the physics caused mainstream science to cast them down from the hallowed halls of good science. And after being cast down from the establishment, it's a long way back into the journals. Scientific careers were at risk if they attempted to publish cold fusion papers. Despite this uh, failure, cold fusion proponents continue to chip away uh, at reproducibility. Uh, and they seem to be making progress. Hundreds of labs around the world have been continuing to report anomalous results. And what does this mean? Does this mean that cold fusion is a fact? It means that we don't know what's going on. Something odd is happening and deserves more investigation. Nobody has produced an agreed upon explanation, scientific explanation of what's going on. Something is going on. We don't know what it is. We don't understand all the details. We haven't been able to reproducibly produce uh, excess heat. We haven't reprodu been able to reproducibly produce uh, fusion products. But we have had many sporadic announcements in the journals. So is this <clears throat> sloppy science or is this real until people can reproducibly uh do this it's going to be skepticism is is the order of the day this is a big thing but it's worth continuing to plug away at this because there could be new science here things that we don't understand a new power source and we need new clean power sources as a, as a society so although uh, this is an ongoing problem. Nobody has sold working low-energy nuclear reaction heaters. 
Uh, there, there is a company called Brilliant Energy who, who are trying to do that and, and purport that they are going to be selling these things soon. Um, but until everybody has one and, and everyone can verify that, yes, these are producing more power than they take, some skepticism is warranted. What do we know about cold fusion? It seems that these positive results could be real sporadic positive results. And so I talked to uh, Lutz Jaitner, who has produced uh, a scientific theory that he purports to describe what might be going on. And this, in his theory, he, he basically thinks that the anomalous cold fusion data is due to quantum objects he calls condensed plasmoids, where huge electron currents, microscopic electron currents, shield internuclear uh, electrostatic repulsion and allow the nuclei to fuse in a quantum mechanical tunneling sort of effect uh, without high temperatures. And I'm not enough of a quantum mechanical expert to critique his work. He's, he's done a computer simulation. And this would require some deep, some sweat and, and backbreaking work that I don't have the time to do or the uh, knowledge. But man, would it be exciting if he was right? that discharges the uh, electrolyte against the cathode. And that creates plasma. And the plasma, by chance, creates condensed plasmoids. And also by chance, they have a certain lifetime. And if you're very lucky, then um, the same condensed plasmoid gets, um, receives a discharge again and again and again, and each time it grows a little bit, and this growing leads to a cratering of the cathode, and that has been clearly seen in all the experiments where, where um, excess heat comes out. You see characteristic craters in your cathode. He purports to describe not only cold fusion with this hypothesis, but also ball lightning and some very weird-looking microscopic tracks on the met metallic conductors involved in, in these cold fusion or LENR electrolysis ex experiments. So I, I withhold judgment respectively, respectfully on, on Lutz's uh, theory or hypothesis uh, until such time as it's been reviewed and shown to make proper predictions. This is the, the mark, the hallmark of a good scientific theory is that the predictions are verified and attempts to discredit it fail. And I don't think it's out there enough and it has not been tested enough to get to the point of the theory. It's a hypothesis still, but man, there's a lot of good ideas. Out there. There's some bad ideas too. Like some people call this thing called the hydrino, uh, which is like a, a uh, a new form of hydrogen uh, with a much um, lower uh, core energy. Uh, so it's a much smaller uh, electron orbit that allows the hydrogen atoms to get closer to each other and fuse as neutral hydrogen. I'd be very surprised if that was the correct explanation. Uh, we know quite a bit about hydrogen. We've been studying it for, for about a century now. A few companies, as I said, are trying to commercialize L-E-N-R, Low Energy Nuclear Reaction Space Heaters. The most prominent of these, uh, and you may have heard of this, was Andrea Rossi's ECAT uh, system, which attracted significant venture capital. And they had snazzy private demos showing, you know, significant heat pr production, you know, gains of, of factors of two and three, uh, but since these demos, a paper uh, has been produced which purports to show how Rossi's public demos might have been a fraud. Uh, physicist Sadri Hassani produced a Skeptical Inquirer article on why ECAT is a hoax in 2019. And he shows that in his research that Rossi actually has a history of jail time and fraud accusations over previous entrepreneurial failures. Uh, calling into question the character of, of this gentleman. But basically, he, he shows that the, the supposedly ironclad public demonstrations of this system could have easily been hoaxes. So again, um, 
some skepticism is called for. That summarizes my uh, cold fusion, warm fusion, hot fusion series of podcasts. I hope you enjoyed listening to them. I hope you loved learning with me. I'm, as I say, I'm going to try to uh, produce more of them over, over coming months. Introducing my next topic, uh, cognitive biases. I want to look into the cognitive biases that impede our rational processing and thinking. Human logic is a most wonderful invention, but our decision processes on their own have been shown not to be logical. We need to develop formal systems of thought like mathematics and Boolean logic and science to check if we're thinking about things correctly. Our brains do not necessarily follow logical Boolean thinking patterns. As scientists, we're taught to identify potential biases and, you know, don't fool yourself is the, is the cardinal rule. And I want to help you to be able to apply these scientific tools in your daily life. And to do that, you need to know what are the biases that people are susceptible to most? What are some of the more common ones? Well, confirmation bias affects us all. And I also am guilty uh, many times of, of falling victim to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias allows us to accept stories that agree with our preconceptions with a lower threshold of evidence than we would apply to stories that don't. Stories that we don't like, we apply very much skepticism. We look for sources and we say, you know, why do you believe that? But if someone comes along and says, yeah, you know, your idea is right and, and this is why I think it, you're going to say, yeah, yeah, listen to this guy. He's smart. That's confirmation bias. What about, uh, what about some of the other ones? The gambler's fallacy. This is a good one. This is where people lose their money at casinos all the time. This is why casinos make money and the house always wins. The gambler's fallacy is where one believes the next in a series of random events or uh, coin flips or random numbers even, random outcomes, depends in any way on the series of past events. So if you have a truly random series of events, you cannot use the previous events to predict what's going to happen next. The next event is independent of everything that's happened before. And the hard part about this is, like, let's say you flip a string of 10 heads in a row on a coin that you know is honest. You know it's an honest coin. It's not a, a fake coin. So, I mean, obviously, if you get 10 heads in a row, you'd start suspecting that it's a two-headed coin, right? But let's say you know it's not. Let's say you know it's an honest coin. You flip 10 heads in a row. What are the odds that the next one will be heads? A lot of people will say, oh, it's it's very good. Or some people will say, oh, no, it's very bad. The next one's got to be tails. Well, no, it's still 50-50. The gambler's fallacy means that you can't predict, you can't plot random events, you can't statistically analyze them to say what's going to happen next. Other biases, obviously gender bias is one that, that affects us all to some extent. Pretty obvious. The bandwagon effect where it's easier to believe something if all your peers do. So that, that's my teaser for, for upcoming episodes. I'm going to look into uh, cognitive biases for you. So please stay tuned, and, and thanks for listening to The Rational View. If you got this far, I appreciate you hanging around. Come join my Facebook group, The Rational View. And in thanks for, for any of you who've got this far in the podcast, um, Come to my, my Facebook group, post a screenshot of your Apple podcast review of The Rational View. I'm going to send five Rational View t-shirts to the five best reviews I see this year before Christmas. So looking forward to, to hearing from you, and thank you all for listening. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patreon.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.